Hi, and welcome to the first episode of Haltech's Technically Speaking for 2018. Today, we're going to be talking about CO2 boost control. Because we're going to go into a fair bit of detail here, we're going to break the video into three sections. First, we'll cover the function of the waste gate. Then, we'll look at how the CO2 system works and its most common applications. And then, we'll go through a step-by-step -step setup procedure using the ESP software. All right, well, let's get started. In order to understand any form of turbocharger boost control, we first need to understand the wastegate. The wastegate is used to channel exhaust gases either through the turbocharger's turbine wheel or bypass it straight into the exhaust. The more exhaust gases go through the turbine wheel, the faster the turbine wheel will spin and the more boost pressure will be achieved. The trick is to control the valve inside the wastegate to funnel just the right amount of exhaust through the turbine, which in turn gets the compressor spinning at the right speed in order to achieve the desired boost level. Okay, let's start by talking about boost referenced boost control, meaning we're monitoring the engine's manifold pressure and controlling it by adjusting the amount of boost pressure that is allowed to get from the boost source, which is normally the outlet of the turbo or the inlet manifold, into the wastegate. To do this, we use a boost controller built into the Haltech ECU and a boost control solenoid, looks like this one. If we allow all of the boost through the boost control solenoid, we will end up running what's known as spring pressure, the amount of boost pressure required to overcome the spring inside the wastegate. Spring looks like this thing. If we start to pulse the boost control solenoid, we'll be able to bleed air off the wastegate to atmosphere and end up with a higher boost level. If we disconnect the pressure source from the wastegate altogether, we'll end up with as much boost as this wastegate configuration can handle. This is normally about double the spring pressure. So, if we've got a 15 pound spring, we'll have good boost control or good bleeding boost control up until about 30 psi of boost pressure. If we've got a 20 pound spring, or two of these inside the wastegate, we'll end up with a good bleeding boost control of around 40 psi. If we want to build more boost than about double the spring pressure, or if we want to run very low boost to very high boost, we'll need to use a different style of boost control. So why would you want to run such varying boost levels? Well, to control power. A drag car might start the run with 5 psi of boost and then wind it up to 60 or 70 or 80 psi as the chassis and the tyres can handle the power. In order to do that, we need CO2 boost control. As the name suggests, this boost control method regulates compressed carbon dioxide to the wastegate instead of boost pressure, resulting in super accurate boost control and the ability to run just about any boost pressure we like. There's nothing overly special about carbon dioxide or CO2, other than it's readily available, it's cheap and it's non-flammable. It's actually used as a fire retardant in some of the fire extinguishers. CO2 is stored in a bottle, just like this one, as a liquid at about 900 psi. Then we use a pressure regulator to bring the pressure down to about 90 psi or about double the maximum target boost pressure. Using this control pressure source means we don't need to use a heavy wastegate spring, which would limit the lowest boost level we can run. Typically a five psi wastegate spring is about all we need. When using boost referenced, we're programming the boost control system to target a desired manifold pressure. When we're using CO2 boost control, we're programming the boost control system to target a desired wastegate pressure, which then directly affects the manifold pressure. Because the wastegate has a much smaller volume than the combination of the turbo outlet, intercooler pipes and plenum, you end up with much better boost control because you're not waiting as long for the controlled loop to stabilize after the change. In order to do this, we require a wastegate pressure sensor. Normally a 150 psi sensor is used, it's the same sensor that you use as an oil or fuel pressure sensor. Actually, while we're looking at this wastegate, if you'll notice this sensor on the top, so TurboSmart have manufactured this wastegate with this position sensor on top of it. So this allows us to see the position of the valve inside the wastegate. 
This is vital information to let us know how much of the available exhaust gases we're putting through the turbine housing and how much is going straight out the exhaust. The second main difference is the number of boost control solenoids required. When using a CO2 system, we'll need two solenoids, one to add the pressure and one to dump the pressure. So this is how it's got to be plumbed. First, in the top right hand corner, you can see our CO2 tank. It's got a regulator on the top and we've set that regulator to about 90 PSI. The pressure comes into port number one on our increase solenoid, straight through out of port two. Then that pressure has got the choice of either going to our bleed or our dump valve to go out to atmosphere. If our wastegate pressure is too high, we'll be dumping it out that bleed valve. Or if our wastegate pressure is too low, that pressure is gonna go down and fill that wastegate hat. We're going to know the pressure inside the wastegate hat because this is also where our wastegate pressure sensor is located. So that's that 150 PSI sensor we spoke about earlier. Right, now it's time to set up the software. To start, we'll assign the wastegate pressure sensor to an available analog input and enter the correct calibration. Next, we'll set up the boost control solenoids, an increase and a decrease, to two available outputs. The mode will be closed loop, meaning the ECU will target a specific pressure rather than a simple generic duty cycle versus RPM table. The controlled parameter will be wastegate pressure. Next, we have the output frequency, which refers to the frequency the boost control solenoids operate at. In our case, we're using the Haltech solenoids, which work at 33 Hertz. The minimum and maximum duty cycle values give the controller a narrower window to work with, resulting in a more accurate control. We're going to leave these at 0 and 100% until we know the working range of the boost controller in any specific application. The max derivative value keeps the control system off until the pressure is stabilised enough to get a reasonable reading. If the pressure is moving by more than say 15 PSI per second, the pressure is not very stable and the control system will remain off until the pressure settles down a little bit. The last setting is the closed loop minimum TPS or throttle position sensor, which disables the control system until we're over a certain throttle position. If the throttle is at 50%, we don't want the ECU to be adjusting the boost control duty cycle as the engine might not be able to make the target boost with the throttle below this value. And finally, now to the fun part, tuning the boost control tables. The first table is the target pressure. In a drag car, I'd normally map this table with race time, normally triggered off the release of the trans brake or the clutch as one axis, and a Haltech rotary trim knob as the other. This way I can map out the target pressure against the full duration of a drag race and have several different boost curves depending on the track conditions. Using the rotary trim knob makes changing the boost curve so easy when you're at the start line and you see the chance to either wind it up or take a little out depending on how the car in front of you went. Next, the start delay, which when controlling the wastegate pressure, it's normally set to zero. This is because there's such a small volume of air being controlled with this method that we don't need to wait for it to stabilise before trying to control it. Lastly, the closed loop PID values. Here are a couple of screenshots of each table with starting values that I use that'll get you in the ballpark. The last step is calibrating the system so that when you target a specific wastegate pressure, you get it. We will need to look at the following channels in the ESP software. The boost target corrected and the wastegate pressure. It's nice to view these in a trace view, but make sure that in the trace view, the minimum and maximum values are the same so these values line up. The wastegate pressure should match the target pressure at all times. We will set up a second trace view showing the PID output channels. This will let us see what the closed loop controller is doing and show us where in the PID tables need to be adjusted if any adjustment is needed. 
To calibrate the system, turn on the CO2 bottle and make sure the throttle position is greater than the closed loop min TPS. Change the target pressure from 0 PSI to 5 PSI and watch the target and actual trace views. Adjust the PID tables until the target and actual values match. Then repeat this process over a range of different target pressures. Once you've done this, the only thing left to do is enter your desired boost curve and you're ready to hit the track. Oh, one last thing. Don't forget to fill the CO2 bottle after every event. There's nothing more disappointing than preparing the car for the race of its life, only to run the entire quarter mile at wastegate spring pressure. Well, that's it for Technically Speaking today. I know it was a long one, so thanks so much for getting through to the end with me. If you're using CO2 boost control in your car with your Haltech ECU, we want to hear about it. Send us some videos, send us some data logs. We'd love to take a look. As always, thanks very much for watching. My name's Scott, and I'll see you next time.